Hello, this is Tyler Crone with the 36th District Democrats. We are so delighted to be interviewing Dave Uptegrove, Chair of the King County Council, who is one of the candidates for Lands Commissioner. Over to you, Dave, to give us your introduction and welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And I'm going to start by doing something a little different. I'm going to use my time to have a hard conversation about the politics of this race. With ballots hitting in less than 10 weeks, there are only two candidates with the resources and support to be able to win this race. One is me. The second is Senator Kevin Vandeweg. And I want you to take one thing away from this interview. Anything other than a sole endorsement will help elect Senator Kevin Vandeweg. This is an epic showdown between the timber industry and the environmental community over the future of our public lands. In the next 90 days between my campaign, Senator Vandeweg's campaign, and probably even more so from the timber industry PACs and the environmental community PACs, you're going to see several million dollars spent in this fight. And I can win this for us. But if the Democratic Party doesn't consolidate behind the environmental community, then Senator Vandeweg will win. Senator Vandeweg voted against the Climate Commitment Act, against our environmental justice law, against the capital gains tax, against the assault weapons ban, and he killed the rent stability bill this year. And the environmental community believes he would be worse on policy than the Republican. I'm the only candidate you're interviewing who's not taking money from corporate timber interests. And I've earned the sole endorsement of Washington Conservation Action, our statewide environmental political organization which by the way is led by a Native American woman and has a board that's two thirds people of color. They've committed their full resources in a massive voter mobilization effort behind this campaign. And I'm here today to ask you to join us in this effort. Thank you. Our first question of our interview will be asked by Stephanie. Over to you, Stephanie. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so the first question is, DNR has an important role generating non-tax revenue for the state. How will you balance the need to generate trust revenue with other values that state lands provide, such as carbon storage and habitat? Thanks. Uh, we need to remember that these trust lands belong to we the people, and they need to be managed in the public interest. And our state Supreme Court clarified recently that we can manage these lands for a myriad of public benefits and DNR is not required to maximize revenue for the trusts, I think we can find a better balance. And I wanna give you a couple examples. First, on day one, I'm going to sign a mature forest policy that ends the destruction of our mature legacy forests. These 77,000 acres store the most carbon, they have the most biodiversity, and we can do this and still generate trust revenue by harvesting other parcels in the short term, and in the long run, by using existing funding streams like the Natural Climate Solutions Program to acquire replacement lands, particularly private timber lands at risk of conversion. Uh, fun fact I've learned, more than 70% of our forestry takes place on private timber lands. And often large investment companies harvest those trees and then we'll unload the property for development. And I think this is a good opportunity for DNR to purchase those lands, bring them into our trust, replant them, and put them back into forestry generating revenue. Uh, another example is the use of carbon offset projects that allow land to be conserved, while also generating funding in the carbon market. And, and sometimes that revenue can actually be more regular and predictable. Uh, and I know it's possible to do this because I helped create a, a project like that as part of King County's land conservation initiative. Uh, but the timber industry's tried to block this. But the good news is uh, Thurston County Court just a week or two ago gave it the go ahead to do. Um, we absolutely need to fully fund public education, but the path to do so doesn't run through DNR, unfortunately. All of the timber revenue from all of our K-12 trust lands account for 1.5% of the state share of new school construction. So we're talking about the state share of construction, only 1.5% comes from this. Uh, in fact, our superintendent of public construction has said that he doesn't even want that and that we need to stop quitting, uh, stop pitting kids against trees. And I agree with that. Time, our next question will be asked from Laura Marie. Hi. Um, in recent years, DNR has sought to take new actions to support healthy forests and reduce wildfire risk. What are your thoughts on steps taken so far? And are there changes or additions to this approach that you would bring? 
And what are your perspectives on the DNR Correctional Camps Program having incarcerated individuals work in wildfire suppression? Well, obviously wildfire prevention is critical, not only for public safety, but also increasingly for public health. I think on the West side, we've all experienced the smoke in recent years, and that has a public health impact. Particularly, I'm concerned about marginalized communities at risk of asthma. And in local government, where I serve now, you learn that emergency response has four phases, prevention, preparation, response, recovery. And it is smartest and most cost-effective, obviously, to focus on prevention. That means managing forest health. And I think of it much like the other landlords who have to keep up their property. DNR also as a landlord needs to maintain our forest lands responsibly. And the good news is, and the good thing that they've been doing that I agree with is they have a 20 year um, forest health plan. And that sets goals for how many acres are treated, meaning how many are managed for fire prevention. And they've made really good progress and deserve credit for it, more than uh, 500,000 acres of treatment. Uh, a couple of areas where I might um, build on that Right now, they're entirely focused on eastern and central Washington, and that kind of makes sense. But I, I, it's time to start looking at setting some goals and doing some of this work in western Washington. Um, I also think we need to do a little better oversight and monitoring and analyzing what's working. Because there's kind of three treatments. You have prescribed fire, you know, the controlled burns, um, or thinning, either commercial thinning or non-commercial. And... Uh, particularly on the commercial thinning side, I want to make sure that we're monitoring that. I want, you know, I'd like to implement some effectiveness monitoring on these different forest health treatments to make sure that we are uh, we're doing things that really are working. Uh, that's not just a backdoor to clear cutting and, and commercial thinning. And finally, I think this is an opportunity where we can do more to work with communities, advance our environmental justice goals. Um, if we're going to be doing more on prescribed burns, which I think makes sense, it's a chance to really engage those local communities in planning for that work because it needs to be done in conjunction with those communities. Time. Thank you. Our next question is from Toby. Yeah, you already partly answered this, but I'll include it. Uh, DNR has a large staff distributed across programs and regions, including yeah. seasonal employees. How would you help build strong, effective relationships for staff and teams across the state and what steps would you take to improve equity and environmental justice outcomes? Sure. I realize I forgot to answer part of that second question. I did a little research on those correctional camps. I generally don't like chain gangs, but this does not appear that this year's be a well-established workforce development program, helping people transition out of corrections. And as long as we're taking care of uh, worker safety and not exploiting people, it's something that I think uh, is supportive. So back to your question, Toby. Sorry, I forgot that second half, that first one. Um, it's going to be one of the biggest challenges. Um, I'm interested in making some changes in the direction of this department. And with its geographic spread, it's going to take strong leadership. In my current role, um, there are six legislative branch agency directors that report to me, as well as a chief of staff, about 200 employees. Um, DNR is a lot larger, but I've helped develop and demonstrated some strong leadership and organizational skills. Um, the first step I would take is it's important for me as commissioner to set very clear vision and expectations and be consistent. Second, I need to hire around that vision and make sure that the key leaders in place are bought into the vision and the direction. And third, we need to train and institutionalize uh, the things we expect, you know, building environmental justice expectations into job descriptions, making sure we are training the leadership and their staff around those expectations. And then I don't, the key then is to then empower those people to carry it out so that I'm not micromanaging how they do it, but I'm setting the direction and the tone. Uh, and it's going to take strength, consistency, hiring, training, uh, and then just good organizational management, bringing the parties together um, to make sure we are, we're doing that. Uh, how do we incorporate environmental justice? It's critical. You know, I came out of the closet the year I first ran for office and my mentor at the time, she said, I love you, Dave, but it's too bad because now you can't run for office because the thought of an out gay legislator in South King County was unheard of. But I ran and won and made history as the first out LGBT legislator in the history of the state. And because of that, I uh, I see my time is up, but I it is 
instilled in me a strong commitment to justice and a commitment to institutionalize environmental justice in all of the work. And I have about 10 things I want to do uh, that I'm happy to share individually around uh, yeah. my environmental justice agenda at the agency. Perfect. So our last question this afternoon before we go to a couple of follow-ups, if time permits, is from Alex. Thank you so much. And thank you for your answers to those previous questions. Um, what do you anticipate will be your biggest, the biggest challenge you would face as lands commissioner if elected? Yep. You know, I think making changes necessary to address the threat of climate change is going to be challenging here. And DNR has a big role to play. Pacific Northwest forests are some of the greatest carbon sinks in the world. I mentioned the Supreme Court ruling that has given us the opportunity to make some changes to forestry practices in order to store more carbon. You know, this means we ought to set ambitious carbon storage and sequestration goals for the next sustainable harvest calculation. It means preserving our legacy forests. You know, they're only 3% of our timberlands, but have an outsized impact on climate. It means reevaluating re how and how often we harvest. It means instituting honest carbon accounting as part of the analysis of proposed timber sales. But it's going to be a challenge because we have to work together on a, a communication strategy because the dominant accepted narrative is that harvesting our forests is good for the climate, climate-friendly industry. It's embedded in our state laws. Um, but the reality is um, that we have opportunities to transform the way we do forestry to do a much better job of sequestering carbon and and ensuring a healthy future for uh, the next generation. And I know these kind of big changes are possible because I've led similar changes in King County. I helped establish, as I mentioned, a forest carbon program as part of our county land conservation initiative. I led successful efforts to stop the destruction of the carbon dense mature forests in King County, including the proposed wishbone timber sale. And at my direction, King County is doing our own carbon accounting. So, and King County can't do this alone. Uh, the State Department of Natural Resources urgently needs to catch up with efforts when it comes to climate and forestry. And I think that's gonna be um, uh, a big body of work and one of the hardest political challenges. Thank you so much. So what we'll do now is our board members can ask you follow up. They will raise their hand and then you'll have one minute responses. Does anyone wanna ask a follow up question? I don't see any, oh, I see a hand from Alex. Alex? Yes, I have one follow-up question. Uh, what do you see the role of the department in collaboration with the tribes of the state of Washington? I know that the department hasn't always had the best relationship with the tribes, so I want to see what your perspective is on that issue and how you would partner with them. Sure. As a commissioner, I'll approach my relationship with the tribes with respect. We have clear treaty obligations that need to be honored. There's a co-management role that needs to be fully realized. But for me, this isn't just a legal issue. We have a greater moral responsibility to not turn away from the genocidal legacy of our colonization, the intergenerational pain, a recognition of the racism that continues today and institutionalize, the institutionalizing tribal needs throughout the agency, I think is more important than simply having a liaison. I think the key is robust communication and early consultation. You know, consultation can't just be lip service. It can't be just checking a box. We need to be engaging more in genuinely joint planning efforts. And one early priority is to work with the tribes on a long-term strategic plan for the use of public lands for clean energy development, because we need to protect our sacred spaces. And I've brought forward a plan for a new clean energy trust. And that envisions that the lands placed in the trust would be identified with the consent of the local tribes, not consultation, but consent. Mm -hmm. uh, we shouldn't be pitting clean energy against tribal sovereignty. We can uh, do better there. Thank you. Barbara? Uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Is my... yes. Thank you. Um, I have a theor kind of a theoretical question. I just wanna hear you think about it. Um, we have a very small percentage of our lands uh, in legacy forests. Is there mm -hmm. anything to be said about thinking about moving more lands, even if they're not in the legacy condition, moving more lands into that category as a way to address uh, climate, is is that a device that has, has any um, tooth to it at all? Yep. Well, the definition, uh, 
we should be doing everything we can to manage these for carbon storage and sustainable economies and, and the health of future generations. And that sometimes involves setting aside some of the special places. Um, the term legacy forest is isn't a category that we define. It's defined based on the nature of those forests. They are naturally regenerated, meaning they're not tree farms. They're structurally diverse, means you know they're when you walk into them, you know them. Um, and they are old, meaning they're almost the definition they're of growth. growth. So we don't get to choose what goes into there. That being said, the department does have other programs where either the commissioner or the legislature, depending on which program it is, can set aside DNR lands for non-timber harvest purposes. One's called the Natural Area Preserve Program. When there's important ecological values on that land, you can uh, set that aside. And I think the commissioner has the authority to do that. Or the Natural Resource Conservation Area Program. The legislature can designate it for recreation and uh, um, so those are some other tools we have. Thank you, Dave. Our last question this afternoon will be from Toby. Toby, over to you. Uh, I really appreciate your statement about uh, DNR uh, picking up cutover lands from the industrial base. How will you fund that? Um, we have some opportunities through existing funding sources to prevent the conversion of private timberlands. First and foremost is if voters will defend um, our Climate Commitment Act, there's funding through a program called the Natural Climate Solutions Program, and that was used this last year to acquire 2,000 acres. In some limited cases, albeit limited, we may also be able to use the Trust Land Transfer Program to acquire some timber lands. And if need be, there's always the option of using state bonds to purchase, but I'm I'm very hopeful that the Natural Climate Solutions um, bucket within the Climate Commitment Act gives us that tool. And remember, it can be over the next 40 years. In the short term, we can harvest other forests. But if we want to make, you know, kind of support a vision of keeping the trust hole, we can do a little bit each year over time. Thank you so much. This concludes the formal part of our interview. We will stop our recording now. Okay.